Steve Jewin, MMA Mania. All right, Steve, you're now on with Steve Jewin of MMA Mania. Go ahead, Steve. Steve Casola, how are you doing today, sir? I am fantastic. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. And hey, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about this right off the top. Thunder Beast. Where do you get a nickname like Thunder Beast? Oh, of course. So, after my uh, second professional fight, I just got done uh, getting my first knockout in competition. My buddies were stoked, and we're actually, uh, you know, driving up to Las Vegas one day for a little uh, Vegas trip with the boys. And one of my buddies, you know, goes to me and says, Hey, Steve, we need to make you a little bit more marketable, man. Like, let's give you a nickname. So we're going back and forth on names. You know, some were serious about, some were just being, jo- you know, joking about. You know, we had some time to kill, so I pop out my phone and start just Googling, oh, fighter nicknames, and just rambling off some. And one of those funny ones that I, you know, uh, mouthed off was Thunder Beast. And both of my friends just looked at each other and yelled, Thunder Beast! As loud as they could. I'm like, oh, Jesus, what did I just do? And uh, they proceeded to call me Thunder Beast the entire Vegas trip. I'm like, ah, it's going to die off. It's going to die off. No problem. No problem. But then right before my uh, third professional fight, uh, the best man at my wedding and the guy who's always in my corner, Eddie Escobar, sneaks up to the DJ booth right before I fight and goes to the DJ and says, hey, you need to announce my Steve Thunder Beast to Zola. And so right before I walk out, I hear Steve Thunder Beast Cazola. I'm like, what the hell did I just hear? And uh, <laughs> But I was too focused. I was too in his own. So I went in there, ended up uh, knocking the guy out in less than a minute. And then as I'm walking out of the cage, I see Eddie doubled over, like stomach hurting, laughing so hard. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it was you. And he just starts dying laughing. He's like, dude, you got to keep it now. You're you're three and no, and you just knock that dude out under under a minute. You got to keep it. So I just decided to roll with it. You know, what, what are you going to do? Well, I'm glad you did keep it because one, it stands out in a world full of pit bulls and assassins, and two, you really do bring the thunder in a beastly way in the cage. You're seven and zero with six knockouts, so you're living up to the name. I appreciate that. Thank you. Nothing like a good roar at the end of a fight as well to really bring that beast out, right? Absolutely. Now you've been off for almost a year, so I have to ask: Is there an injury involved, or are we just taking some time to work on the craft? Um, it was more circumstantial than everything. Uh, how things were going with wheelchairs, the fighting was just kind of back and forth in my management at the time. It was just a situation that wasn't coming together, wasn't producing results. We live in a results-based society, and uh, after talking with my wife about what we need to do to move forward and make this dream reality, we decided that we needed to uh, cut ties from World Series of Fighting and then change management. Now I'm with Tiki Gosen. I'm back with Bellator, where I should be, and the stars are aligning. So look for a very exciting year for me in uh, 2017. You know, that is something I was wondering about, because I got used to seeing you in Bellator for a couple of fights, and then you went to World Series, and I was like, this seems odd. He was doing so well there. Why would they let an undefeated fighter go? Uh, you tell me, man. I don't know either. I, I tried to call him and get back, but I wasn't hearing anything, and what do you got to do? You got to move on and uh, just keep going. So, again, everything happens for a reason. It's in the past. We always push forward. Um, you know, and that's just one of those things that if it's out of your control, you don't worry about it. You look forward, you deal with your adversity, you overcome it, you become a better person, you learn, and uh, you just get back after it. Well, I can't say it slowed your momentum because now you're coming back and you're going to be on a really big card with Rampage and King Mo. So how does it feel knowing you're on the main card of that big temple event, as they like to call them? Oh, my goodness. I couldn't be more blessed, more thankful, uh, more excited for the opportunity. I'm fighting back in my home state of Illinois. Um, last time I was there, I had a knockout of the night, so I'm looking to repeat that performance. And the fact that I'm on, you know, Bellator's done such a phenomenal job of, uh, how, you know, their stage, their presence, and everything like that. So I'm coming into an amazing situation. There's, you know, King Mo, Rampage, what outstanding names to be headlighting the card. I know they're going to do a lot to make that card phenomenal. So I couldn't be more thankful and more excited to be on the, you know, get this platform and uh, represent my country, my state my team, my family, my friends, and uh, it's going to be an amazing night for us. With so much to represent on top of being undefeated, does that add some extra pressure? You know, pressure can either burst pipe or create diamonds. I decide that it's going to create a uh, diamond in me. You know, you only let the pressure affect you if you make things overcomplicated. You just need to simplify the situation. you got to step into a cage, the ref needs to say go, you need to beat the guy in front of you, and then stop when he says stop. That's it. I know you're not going to overcomplicate things, but being undefeated and being in a featured division of Bellator, you've got to be thinking at some point things continue to roll the way they are. I want to be looking at a fight with a guy like Michael Chandler. I mean, if you're not look, if you're not working for, you know, looking to go forward, you're going backwards. So 
I mean, like I said, you know, if I'm always going to try to just keep moving up the ladder in the division and try to get closer and closer to that belt. The only person I'm willing to take a step for is Dylan Dennis, and uh, I would love to fight him and, you know, welcome him to Bellator. And then once I'm done with him, I'll go back to moving up the division. What do you think about Dylan Dennis anyway? Because I've noticed the guy engenders a lot of mixed emotions. Like, a lot of people don't seem to like him very much, but obviously Conor McGregor loves that dude. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's great. You know, uh, Dylan Dance is a very talented individual in the grappling department. I mean, his, being a Marcelo Garcia black belt, all his credentials in jiu-jitsu is just absolutely phenomenal. Where I have a problem is his authenticity with himself. All of a sudden, you start training with Conor McGregor being around him, and now he's trying to impersonate him and copy him. Don't be a copycat. Be you. Be the best, most authentic you you can be, and that's what people are really going to, you know, like and uh, really be a magnet to. He's all of a sudden changing, you know, his ways. You know, you're like, oh, I dress this, I make this money, you know, I ball out. Come on, dude, you're a jiu-jitsu player. The only money that you have is what Conor McGregor's giving you, and let's just be honest about it. You know, we, we use your jiu-jitsu background and, and push that up and increase the jiu-jitsu community. But now, he's, you know, he's taking away the martial art and the warrior ethos and started being, you know, like Conor. Conor's Conor. Conor is his authentic self. He's been that way from day one. So good for him. That's who he is. This is not who Dan, you know, this is not who Dylan Danis is. So he's also, but you know, I think he's been up way more than he can chew coming into Bellator without even working his way up. So if he wants to come in and fight someone in the division, I'll welcome him into the division. I'll knock him out and then I'll go back up to moving up the ladder. I mean, I don't think that's going to happen. I personally think he's going to get some tomato cans at 170s and then he's going to learn how to, you know, cut way to 155, probably the wrong way. And then he's going to get to 55 and as soon as he fights a contender, he's going to go right back down. You know, so I would love to welcome him to the 155 pound weight class if he can make the weight, which I doubt. And we'll see, and we'll go forward from there. Well, you've talked about knocking him out if you do welcome him, and you've knocked out a lot of people, but I know you've got some jujitsu belts of your own, so what about just straight up grappling him? I mean, we haven't seen a submission from you yet. I think that would be fun to see you actually submit somebody instead of knock him out. I, I, I'm never opposed to any sort of finish, whether it be a knockout or submission. When the opportunity to finish the fight is there, I will take it, whatever it is. If it's a choke, I will choke them out. If it's a knockout, I will knock them out. If I can snap their arm, leg, ankle, I will do so. It's all about finishing the fight and not letting it go to the judges. How that comes, I don't have any preference. I just like finishing fights. Have you ever looked at a situation where you've looked at a fighter on paper and said, oh, I can get this guy to the ground and submit him, and then you just ended up knocking him out anyway? You just surprised yourself? Uh, yes, that would be my fourth fight with uh, Danny Morales. I definitely went with that game plan of uh, going in to uh, take him to the floor. I thought that was going to be my best advantage was to be in a top position where great ground pound, go into a mount and get a submission or uh, a TKO finish. But the spinning back elbow happens. So that's why you have to be adapt, you know, adapt to your surroundings, be versatile and, uh, you know, have good fluidity and just let the dice, you know, let things uh, fall as they may. Speaking of that spinning back elbow, do you like flashiness when you do a fight or do you just think that straight up coming forward and letting your hands do the work is the way to go? I think you need to have a, if you don't have fundamentals, then you shouldn't be, if you don't have fundamentals, then don't even be trying to do your flashy spinning stuff. You know, the good thing is that I come from a Taekwondo background. I got my black belt in Taekwondo at a young age. So I've been comfortable with spins and flashy kicks from a very early age. But what I've been working on lately is just using my fundamentals, fundamental boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, wrestling, Jiu Jitsu. And that's where I really build on. And the, the spinning attacks and the, you know, being creative, that just comes with everything. I just let that stuff flow, and when the opportunity presents itself to be creative, then I'll then I'll do it. It's just tricks I like to have in my back pocket, so, you know, to keep the other guy guessing and, and keep them on their toes. Do you think there are some guys that maybe rely a little too much on the flash? Like Michael Venom Page in his fight with Fernando Gonzalez, you know, everybody was expecting that big flashy knockout, and instead it was such a tactical fight that he could never get in there and land that big explosive spinning strike that he likes to do. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, Fernando Gonzalez is my teammate. He will be my head corner for this fight. You know, um, you know, that's what Fernando does, man. He puts the pressure on you. He takes away all your spinning attacks by closing in the distance, you know, and, uh, but, you know, but you can tell that Paige definitely got out of his element, was not expecting that. And he, you know, he created a boring fight, you know, with his constant disengagement. He was trying to create distance and wasn't willing to engage at a close distance at all. So it, it, it led to a, a lackluster fight on his end. You know, Fernando went in there ready to fight, and I don't think he went in there ready to bang. It's hard to dance when, you know, one partner is not willing to. So, you know, I, I think if he were to just, you know, focus on the fundamentals and add in his flashy kicks, say like a, you know, Chandler or a Yair Rodriguez, like that's how you got to do it. You know, like mix it in, you know, mix in your stuff. But if you solely go off of that, oh man, it's going to lead to some boring fights eventually when you get some good grinders and good grapplers in there. 
I'm happy to say that I talked to Fernando before his last fight, and he predicted he would come back in a big way with Brandon Gertz, and he gave him a lot of respect, you know, because Brandon was taking the fight and coming up and wait to meet him, and things obviously worked out for Fernando. So what are your thoughts on his success in Bellator as a teammate of his? Fernando's a, a, a leader. Fernando's a mentor, and Fernando's a phenomenal individual. I look up to him a lot, and I look for his guidance and his instruction. He's one of my also my top training, you know, training partners and sparring partners. He's a, a phenomenal person to be around. I am so grateful to um, be around him when I'm with my team. I'm so grateful that I'm going to have him in his corner in this fight. He knows how I fight. He knows my style, and plus, he's a big name in Bellator, you know, and that, that's amazing. Anything I can do to help him. I will do, and he will do anything to help me as well. So just being around someone like him and all the guys at Team Quest and the guys at Oceanside Jiu-Jitsu, Manny Torres, boxing, I mean, again, championship environment. If you're not surrounding yourself with those type of people, then you're losing. You know, so I look to I look towards guys like him to beat an example and to uh, show us how it's done properly and uh, to follow suit. And you have to love the fact that, you know, like you said, not only is he an experienced fighter and not only does he have great direction, but with that veteran status he has in Bellator, you got to think if he puts a few more wins together, a title shot's coming. It seems like he's been overdue for one for a little while now. Absolutely. And the good thing is that uh, Bellator has such a, a stacked and amazing 170-pound division. So there's plenty of great fights out there for him. The title's going to come eventually just in due time. So he has uh, a really exciting future ahead of him. You know, he's grinding. He's looking to improve every single day. He's dedicating himself 100% to fighting and helping us out. So look to him to really make some noise 2017 for sure. Well, you talk about it being a stacked division, but I think the lightweight division is equally stacked. I know you want to welcome Dylan Dennis if you get a chance, but I'd like to see you fight some guys like Patricky Pitbull too. I think that'd be fun. Absolutely. Again, you know, when Bellator presents me with a fighter, then we will uh, assess it and go forward. You know, I'm, again, I'm always looking to move up. I don't, I don't want to move back unless it's for Dylan. But, you know, I'm going to take this one fight at a time. Right now we got March 31st. After that, I want to go to London. And then after that, we'll see what is after, after that as well. You know, I'm looking to be very active this year. I've taken way too much time of not performing, not displaying my skills. I have not taken time off. I have always gotten better, always improved, both physically, mentally, spiritually. And uh, that's what I'm going to show in this fight as well, just my constant improvement, my dedication, and uh, my consistency in, in my improvement. All right, Steve, as we start to wrap it up, give me your thoughts on Jake Roberts, because this is a guy who previously had the undefeated tag around his neck as well, and then he took his first loss in his last Bellator fight, so you know he's hungry coming into this. Absolutely, as he should be. I expect him to be a very hungry individual, and I, I mean, he's uh, a talented individual. He's got a, a good team behind him at the lab. I know he has guys like Benson Henderson and probably Efrain Escudero behind him, and that's great. You know, um, I think he's a good fighter. I think he's got good stand up. I think he's got good wrestling. I think he's got good jujitsu. Um, but I think where he lacks is the great part. I don't think he's got great stand up or, or great anything, if I'm being honest. I know my preparation, my stand up, my wrestling, my jujitsu is all phenomenal. And that's what I'm looking to display is, uh, display is that difference between good and great here and that constant devotion and dedication to the sport. I don't take time off. I don't get big between, between fights or whatever. I, this is a lifestyle. I live it every single day my nutrition the way i think my improvement with my mind my body and that's how you gotta live to be the best so with that mentality hey if you get a knockout and they call you four weeks later and say hey we need you for a main event you could be ready to go i'm always ready to go one week two weeks you know i what i want to do is i want to handle business march 31st and then i want to hop over the pond and uh, go take care of business in london as well I know, there, I know there's a Brit or European out there that would love to fight me, so let's do it. <laughs> well, Bellator is listening, so I'm sure they can arrange that for you. But let me go ahead and give you this opportunity to throw out some plugs. You've already thrown out a lot for your team, but I know you got some social media ones as well. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I just want to start by, by thanking God. Um, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be blessed with all these opportunities and all these great people around me. He gave me the you know fortitude to keep on pushing forward even when times are tough. I want to thank my team. Team Quest, Oceanside Jiu-Jitsu, Manny Torres Boxing. I want to thank my sports psychologist, Tim Dixon, my manager, Tiki Gosen, my wife, Ashley, my son, Bradley. I love you guys so much. Thank you to my sponsors, Clinch Gear, Quality Dedicated Tattoo, uh, Pierce Labs, West Coast Chiropractic. Uh, without their support, I uh, wouldn't be here. Also, thank you so much to the men and women of our U.S. military. With all of their sacrifices, none of us would be able to do what we're doing. So for them to put their lives on the line and everything it's just phenomenal also the men and women and uh all men and women of service from firemen paramedics policemen please support them please look out for them they do so much and sacrifice so much for us that you know we couldn't even begin to understand so so all we can do is be thankful and support them as much as we can 
Well, right on. I'm the son of a Navy man myself, so I fully support our armed services and all the sacrifices they make. But before I let you go, Steve, I also want to say, at Steve Cazola MMA on Twitter, everybody should be following the Thunder Beast and follow him into the cage on March 31st against Jake Roberts. Appreciate it, bro. Thank you for the time. God bless. No doubt about it. Thank you very much, and thank you, Dan, as well.